If we want to study thermodynamics, that is the theory of heat, we need to start with the concept of heat. Everyday experience indicates that we have to introduce other quantities besides temperature to interpret the phenomena related to warmth in nature. For example, let us begin with a simple observation on the thermal state of bodies. If two bodies with different temperatures brought into thermal contact, then they settle to the same temperature. Let the red square represent a warm body with a temperature T1 and the blue one a cold body with a temperature T2, where T1 is greater than T2. Let us also assume that the two bodies are thermally insulated from their environment, which is represented by the rounded corner rectangle enclosing the symbols of the two bodies. Therefore, these bodies have no thermal contact with their environment or surroundings. If we bring the two bodies into some thermal contact represented by the green rectangle and measure the temperatures of the bodies, then we will see the temperatures change in time. The temperature of the warm body decreases while the temperature of the cold one increases until they reach a common temperature T3. We explain the phenomenon of the temperature equalization by applying the concept of heat, and state that the warmer body becomes colder, transferring some amount of heat to the colder one which in turn becomes warmer. Therefore, the change in the temperature of any object can be explained by the fact that some amount of heat was transported to, or from the object. Once the temperatures of the bodies are equal, the net heat transfer between the two bodies is zero, that is the objects exchange equal amount of heat among themselves for a given time interval. The following experiments can help us to find out how to measure the amount of heat transferred among bodies and determine the physical unit of heat. We will perform experiments with heating of different fluids, where we assume that the amount of the heat transferred to the fluids is proportional to the duration of heating. Let us pour half a liter of water into a container at 20 degrees Celsius which is about half a kilogram, and start to warm it. We measure both the temperature of the warming liquid and the duration of heating. When the temperature of the water reaches 25 degrees Celsius, we check the time elapsed from the beginning of heating, which we denote by T. Let Q denote the amount of heat transferred to the water during that time. If we continue the warming of the water until its temperature reaches 30 degrees Celsius, we find that the time of heating is about 2 times T. Since we assume that the transferred heat is proportional to this time interval, the heat absorbed by the liquid is about 2 times Q. If we perform this experiment with 1 kilogram water, we will see that it takes about 2 times longer to warm up the liquid from 20 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. Therefore, the amount of the heat transferred to the water is equal to about 2 times Q. When the temperature of water reaches 30 degrees Celsius, we find that the time of heating is about 4 times T. As a result, we can state that the heat absorbed by the liquid is about 4 times Q. If we repeat this experiment with petrol, we find that the time of heating is always about the half of the one measured for water but the ratios between the measured time intervals remain the same. Therefore, the heat absorbed by the petrol is also the half of the heat absorbed by the water. Other words, it takes twice as long to produce the same amount of increase in the temperature for water than for petrol, which indicates that water needs two times more heat to increase its temperature by 5 or 10 degrees than petrol. At the same time, we see that in both cases the absorbed heat is proportional to the temperature difference and the mass of the liquid. We can also conclude from the results obtained for water and petrol that the proportionality factor between heat and mass, or heat and the difference in temperature depends on the physical properties of the liquid. Then we can talk about two cases related to the transport of heat between a body and its environment, warming bodies and cooling ones. A body with mass M and the physical properties characterized by the proportionality factor C at the temperature T1 is warming, if the body absorbs an amount Q of heat and its temperature rises, reaching the temperature T2, where T1 is less than T2. In the case of cooling, the body releases an amount Q of heat and the body is cooled to the temperature T2, where T1 is greater than T2. In order to give a quantitative description of the transport of heat changing the temperature of a body, we can state that the heat Q delivered to a body with mass M is given by the proportionality constant C, times the mass M, times T2 minus T1, if its temperature changes from T1 to T2. We can also say that the amount of heat delta Q exchanged between a body and its environment is proportional to the mass M of the body, times the change delta T in the temperature of the body, where the proportionality factor C depends on the physical properties of the body. Here we always assume that there are no chemical reactions taking place in the process which could release or consume heat. These formulae also show that the delivered heat to a body is negative for cooling. When the initial temperature T1 of the body is greater than its final temperature T2, the body delivers heat to its surroundings. 
We can draw the same conclusion on the transport of heat from the following experiment mixing different materials with different temperatures. Let us pour water with the temperature 20 degrees Celsius into a container until its mass reaches 100 grams. Let also heat 50 grams water to 80 degrees Celsius, and pour it into the container filled with the cold water. If we mix the cold and the hot water in the container and measure the temperature of the mixture, we see that it goes up to 40 degrees Celsius. Then we can write the following equation for the relation of the products of the mass and the change in the temperature for the cold and hot water. 100 grams times 40 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius is equal to 50 grams times 80 degrees Celsius minus 40 degrees Celsius. We can denote the different quantities in this equation with the following letters. The mass of the cold water is denoted by M1, the temperature of the mixture is denoted by T3, the temperature of the cold water is denoted by T1, the mass of the hot water is denoted by M2, the temperature of the hot water is denoted by T2, and again, the temperature of the mixture is denoted by T3. As a result, we obtain the equation stating that the mass M1 times the difference between the temperatures T3 and T1 is equal to the mass M2 times the difference between the temperatures T2 and T3. If we mix water with different masses and initial temperatures and measure the temperature of the mixture, we can demonstrate that this relationship holds for arbitrary masses and initial temperatures. We can also mix different solid materials in water. For example, we take 100 grams water at 20 degrees Celsius again, and we heat up 50 grams iron filings to the temperature 80 degrees Celsius. If we pour the hot iron filings into the container and mix it with the cold water, we can measure the temperature of the mixture. We will see that the temperature in the container is 23 degrees Celsius after mixing. Although we cannot establish the same relationship between the masses and the changes in the temperatures of the water in the iron filings, we still have the following equation. 100 grams times 23 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius is proportional to 50 grams times 80 degrees Celsius minus 23 degrees Celsius, where the proportionality constancy depends on the physical properties of the water in the iron filings. In this case the value of C is 0.1. Here we can use the following notations for the quantities in the equation. The mass of the water is denoted by M1, the temperature of the mixture is denoted by T3, the temperature of the cold water is denoted by T1, the mass of the iron filings is denoted by M2, the temperature of the iron filings is denoted by T2, and again, the temperature of the mixture is denoted by T3. We also assume that we can write the proportionality constant as the ratio of a constant C2 to a constant C1, where C1 depends only on the physical properties of the water and C2 depends only on the physical properties of the iron filings. Then we obtain the equation stating that C1 times M1, times T3 minus T1 is equal to C2 times M2, times T2 minus T3. If we change the masses of the water in the container and the iron filings and heat them to various initial temperatures then we find that the equation still holds. Therefore this relationship gives a general quantitative description of the transport of heat during the mixing of two materials. Here we neglected the heat dissipation over the wall of the container and through the gauge of the thermometer measuring the temperature. We can interpret this result as the water absorbed an amount Q of heat during its warming, where Q is equal to C1 times the mass M1 of the water, times the increase T3 minus T1 in its temperature. Whereas the iron filings release the same amount of heat, which can also be written as C2 times the mass M2 of the iron filings, times the decrease T2 minus T3 in its temperature. Such experiments were performed in 1747 by Georg Wilhelm Richmond, a German physicist, who tried to determine the temperature T3 produced by mixing a quantity of water given by the mass M1 at temperature T1, with another quantity of water given by the mass M2 at temperature T2. The quantitative description of mixing hot and cold water was a well-known problem at that time, and a formula providing the temperature of the mixture was already available. However, there was a discrepancy between the calculations and the result of Richmond's experiments, and he could find a formula confirmed by the results of his measurements. He concluded that the temperature T3 of the mixed water is equal to M1 times T1 plus M2 times T2, divided by M1 plus M2, which is a simple averaging the temperatures weighted by the quantities of water. If we multiply this equation by M1 plus M2 and reorder the terms in the result, we obtain the equation which we have already derived. That is, M1 times T3 minus T1 is equal to M2 times T2 minus T3. We have seen that this relationship can be generalized for mixing of different materials with the formula stating that C1 times M1, times T3 minus T1 is equal to C2 times M2, times T2 minus T3, 
where we take the physical properties of the mixed materials into account by applying the multiplicative factors C1 and C2. In this experiment the left-hand side of the equation represents the amount of heat absorbed by the cold water, whereas the right-hand side of the equation represents the amount of heat released by the hot water. In his experiments, Richmond could demonstrate that if two bodies are in thermal contact then the heat released by the warmer one is equal to the heat absorbed by the colder one, that is there is an exchange of heat between the two bodies. If a body with the physical properties described by the constant C1 and mass M1 has the temperature T1, and another body with the constant C2 and the mass M2 has the temperature T2, then they will exchange heat in thermal contact. They settle to the same temperature T3, which is given by C1 times M1 times T1 plus C2 times M2 times T2, over C1 times M1 plus C2 times M2, if the two bodies are thermally insulated from their environment, that is, there is no exchange of heat between them and their surroundings. This formula follows from the equation describing the transport of heat between the two bodies thermally insulated from their surroundings. As a result, an important conclusion can be drawn from Richmond's experiments. Heat is conserved in such an insulated system, that is, heat is not created or destroyed but transported within the system. We will see that the conservation of heat is one of the findings which led to the formulation of first law of thermodynamics. Based on the results of these experiments, we can define the physical unit of heat, and introduce the concepts of specific heat and heat capacity, as the quantitative descriptions of the behavior of bodies related to the change in their thermal state when they absorb or release heat. We call the physical unit of heat calorie, abbreviated with cal, which is defined as follows. One calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Since the physical state of water depends on its temperature and pressure, several definitions of the unit of heat exist. This table shows some of these definitions at different temperatures. Generally, 1x degrees calorie denoted by cal sub x is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of 1 gram of water from the minimum temperature T min to the maximum temperature T max at standard atmospheric pressure. We see that T min is 3.5 degrees Celsius and T max is 4.5 degrees Celsius in the definition of 4 degrees calorie, that is 4 degrees Celsius is an average temperature of water warmed from the temperature T min to the temperature T max. Similarly, for 15 degrees calorie the temperatures T min and T max are 14.5 degrees Celsius and 15.5 degrees Celsius, and for 20 degrees calorie these temperatures are 19.5 degrees Celsius and 20.5 degrees Celsius. There also exists a definition for mean calorie, which uses a broad temperature range, where the minimum temperature is 0 degrees Celsius and the maximum one is 100 degrees Celsius. In the third column of this table we can see the value of 1 calorie sub x divided by 15 degrees calorie, which is maybe the most frequently used definition. This column demonstrates that the definition of calorie depends on the temperature range used for it, since 1 4 degrees calorie is about 44 thousandths greater than 1 15 degrees calorie. Similarly, 1 20 degrees calorie is 84 thousandths smaller and 1 mean calorie is 11 thousandths greater than 1 15 degrees calorie. When we clarify the relationship between heat and energy we will able to provide an alternative definition of the unit of heat, and these different definitions can be converted into the new unit. By fixing the unit of heat, we can give the proportionality constant C appearing in the equation of heat transfer a unique interpretation. If we express C from the transfer equation of heat, we see that it is equal to the amount Q of heat divided by the mass M times the difference T2 minus T1 of the temperature, or 1 over M, times the ratio of delta Q to delta T. These equations show the following. For a substance with unit mass, the constant C gives the amount of heat needed to increase its temperature with 1 degree Celsius. We have already stated that the value of C depends on the physical properties of materials. When Joseph Black, Scottish physicist and chemist studied the transfer of heat between bodies, he found that different substances with equal masses needed different amounts of heat to increase their temperature with the same amount. Black introduced the concept of specific heat for the proportionality constant between heat and the increase in the temperature of a body with unit mass, which provided a quantitative description of this behavior. For a body with unit mass, specific heat gives the amount of heat needed to increase the temperature of the body with 1 degree Celsius. Generally, if a body with mass M receives the infinitesimal amount dQ of heat and increases its temperature with the amount dT, then its specific heat C is 1 over M times the ratio of dQ to dT. Therefore, we can interpret the definition of specific heat of a substance with mass m as 1 over m times the derivative of the heat q absorbed or released by the substance with respect to its temperature t. 
This equation indicates that the amount of the heat Q exchanged between a body and its environment depends on not only the difference in the temperatures of the body and its surroundings, but also the absolute temperature of the body. The ability of a substance to absorb or release heat clearly depends on its physical properties, which in turn depend on its temperature. As a result, we always treat the heat Q transferred between a body and its environment as a function of its temperature T, and we can determine its heat capacity by differentiating the function Q with respect to T. Its definition shows that the unit of specific heat is simply calorie per gram times degree Celsius. The heat capacity capital C of a body can also be defined as the product of its mass M and its specific heat C, and it provides the amount of heat needed to increase its temperature with 1 degree Celsius. Then the derivative of the heat Q exchanged by a substance with its surroundings with respect to its temperature T simply gives the heat capacity of the substance. From this definition we see that the unit of heat capacity is calorie divided by degree Celsius. The technique used to measure the heat transferred to or from a substance, or more generally the amount of heat involved in any chemical or physical process is known as calorimetry. The measurement is performed with a thermally insulated and calibrated device, which we call calorimeter. Since the device is insulated, the heat exchange between the calorimeter and its environment is negligible. Heat flow at constant pressure can be measured by using a constant pressure calorimeter, which allows us to study chemical reactions in mixtures at a constant atmospheric pressure. A simplified version of constant pressure calorimeters is a coffee cup calorimeter. Such an equipment consists of two nested styrofoam cups closed with a loose fitting lid to thermally isolate the solution in the cups from the surroundings, as seen in the figure. The photo shows a more professional apparatus, which is a double wall calorimeter based on the same principle. A thermometer and a stirrer are placed into the sealed cups or the double wall container through two holes in the lid to measure the temperature and mix the reactants. The principle of the measurement is the following. First we pour distilled water in the calorimeter and measure the initial temperature of the fluid. Then we dissolve reactants in the distilled water and start to mix the solution. As chemical processes take place in the reaction mixture the temperature of the liquid changes. In the case of exothermic reactions the reaction produces heat which increases the temperature of the water. When an endothermic reaction occurs, the reaction consumes heat and absorbs it from the solution, decreasing the temperature of the liquid. We can measure the maximum or minimum temperature of the solution and calculate the difference delta T in its temperature by subtracting the initial temperature from this value. Since the volume of the liquid is large, we can assume that the calorimeter absorbs a negligible amount of heat and the specific heat of the solution is the same as the one of the distilled water. Then the amount Q of heat released or absorbed in the experiment is given by the mass M of the liquid, times the specific heat Cp of the water at constant pressure, times the difference delta T of the temperature of the water. The next type of technique is constant volume calorimetry measuring heat flow in a constant volume. Constant volume calorimetry is used for measuring heat of a particular reaction, especially combustion, where the aim is to determine the calorific value of the fuels. The typical devices applied in constant volume measurements are the bomb calorimeters, which are built in such a way that they can withstand the large pressure produced within the apparatus due to any reaction of the burning fuel. A bomb calorimeter basically consists of enclosed stainless steel can, called bomb, containing the fuel sample with the presence of pure oxygen as seen in the figure. A fully automatized version of such instruments is shown in the photo including the bomb and the insulated container with a built-in control electronics. The combustion takes place in the pressurized and heavy-walled bomb, which is placed in the container filled with water. The water is stirred continuously to enhance the exchange of heat between the bomb and the liquid. A fuse wire connected to two electrodes is kept in contact with the reactants inside the bomb. After the temperature of the apparatus is stabilized, a high voltage is sent across the electrodes and through the fuse wire. The combustible matter is electrically ignited and starts to burn with the presence of pure oxygen. During the combustion kept under a constant volume condition, heat is released by the burning fuel. Since the bomb is in controlled thermal contact with its surroundings, the water absorbs the heat and its temperature rises. The water temperature continues to rise for some time which can be measured by the thermometer. When it is leveling off and becomes stable, the temperature is recorded together with the initial temperature. The difference delta T between the stable final and initial states gives the measured increase in the temperature of the water. Since the total heat given off in the reaction is equal to the heat gained by the water and the calorimeter, the heat absorbed by the water is given by the mass M of the water, times the specific heat C of the water, times the change delta T in its temperature. The heat gained by the calorimeter is equal to the heat capacity capital C cal of the calorimeter times delta T. 
if the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter material, water, and the fuse wire is known, one can calculate the total amount of heat released by combustion of the fuel sample. The third approach presented here is called differential scanning calorimetry, which is used to study endothermic and exothermic transition and determine transformation temperatures in glass transition, melting or crystallization. This technique also enables thermal property and purity analysis, the study of heat history and chemical reactions, and allows one to monitor the variation of the specific heat of materials as a function of temperature. In a traditional calorimeter, a sample is placed in an isolated chamber surrounded by some medium. If a chemical reaction is triggered in the sample, the difference between the temperatures of the sample and the surrounding medium gives information about the heat release and the consumption of the reaction. The differential scanning technique goes further, and uses both a sample and a reference kept under the same conditions and measures the exchange of heat between them and their surroundings. A sample and a reference material are usually in an empty pans or holders which are identical. The figure shows a differential scanning calorimeter, which consists of the sample and reference holder also called sample unit, the heater with a heat resistor and the heat sink working with cooling gas, which has enough heat capacity compared to the sample. The lid of the sample holder has a hole to allow the escape of some amount of the sample and its exchange with the surrounding gas if it is vaporized. Heat is supplied into the sample and the reference through the heat sink and the heat resistor of the heater, where the heating has a controlled rate determined by the reference temperature T ref. Heat flow is proportional to the heat difference of the heat sink and the holders. When endothermic or exothermic phenomena occur in a reaction or transition, heat is compensated by the heat sink. The oven is purged with the sample gas, so that transitions and chemical reactions in different atmospheres can be examined. Different purge gases can also be used in the experiments, for example air providing an oxidative environment, and nitrogen providing an inert environment. This solution helps to identify any decomposition products by oxidation or by internal thermal degradation. In the photo, we can see a differential scanning calorimeter with its control unit in the left-hand side and the thermally insulated container with the sample unit in the right-hand side. In the method of heat flux differential scanning, the temperature difference T diff between the sample and the reference material is measured as a function of temperature. Another approach is power compensation differential scanning, where the measurement is a dynamic process. When a transition occurs in the sample such as melting or crystallization, the difference of released or absorbed heat is applied to the sample and the reference material per unit time to keep them at the same temperature, while the temperature T ref of the whole sample unit is varied in a specified program. The difference between the amount of heat supplied to the sample and the reference is proportional to the difference T diff between their temperatures, which is measured by thermocouples and recorded on the scan as a function of temperature T ref. By calibrating the standard material, a quantitative measurement for the unknown sample is achievable. A sinusoidal temperature modulation can also be superimposed on the rate of change in temperature, which allows the simultaneous measurement of heat capacity and kinetic effects. This plot shows the difference Q in the heat flux versus the temperature applied to the sample unit, where the differential signal is displayed as a baseline, and a transition, for example solid-solid or glass transition, crystallization and the melting of a metal can be observed as a peak. The area of the peak gives the amount of heat and the direction of the peak indicates the direction of heat flux. For melting and endothermic reactions the peak points downward, whereas for crystallization and exothermic reactions it points upward. 